It is my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce Charlie Moore, uh, the founder and CEO of Rocket Lawyer. And he's going to talk to you about the challenges of getting to 100,000 paid subscribers uh, and in leading and growing a great business. So with that, Charlie, it's very nice to see you. Great to see you, man. All right, I think I'm going to stand up. Please. If you don't mind. So I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I want to thank Jason. Um, Jason and I actually went to law school together. For those of you who don't know, Jason Lemkin is a lawyer. And so uh, I, I knew him when. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be here. So I'm Charlie Moore. I'm the founder of Rocket Lawyer. We're uh, an online legal service. We're bootstrapped as well to get started. And uh, our mission is to make law affordable and simple for everyone. Uh, I always uh, start out by just saying, there's nobody in the room, I think, that's going to raise their hand and say that legal services and lawyers uh, don't cost too much or are affordably priced, right? I'm a former high-priced lawyer at a Silicon Valley law firm. So uh, people don't have access to justice. Justice is the fair administration of the law authority. Uh, it, that's our mission, uh, to bring down the cost of legal services so that the majority of people who are currently priced out of the market for legal help can afford it. And so with that, I'll talk about how we started as a bootstrap company and uh, now are north of 100,000 paid subscribers and 10 million uh, users altogether. So I organized this uh, talk into you have 1,000 users, you have 10,000, 25,000, 100,000, and beyond. At 1,000, I mean, when we got started, uh, every single order that was placed uh, banged my phone. I got a ping every single time. I was, you know, jumping for joy. And so uh, at 1,000 paying customers, just live in the moment. Uh, the first thing I would say is starting a business should be a joyful experience. Selling a brand new product successfully to over 1,000 people, that's amazing. While entrepreneurs are usually their biggest critics, yours truly included, make sure to stay in the present moment at every stage. Don't get too high, but definitely don't get too low and enjoy it. So when you get your first 1,000 users or those who already have, you know, stop back and or take a minute and uh, smell the roses, enjoy the present. Beyond that, like I said, you know, when we started, every single uh, order pinged my phone. Our team was a tiny little group. Uh, you know, every time that we got an order, we discovered new things about the service, things that were broken, things that we could do better. This was about the time that a major celebrity tried out our infant legal service. We couldn't believe it. We created Rocket Lawyer to make the law affordable and simple for regular people, so we were shocked to find out that this worldly, wealthy person was using this discount legal service, it was kind of at that time that we realized that, hey, maybe there was a bigger set of problems that we could solve beyond just cost. It opened our eyes to the possibility that, you know, maybe Rocket Lawyer really could be for everyone. So again, lesson number one, as it says up there, is to stop and enjoy the journey. You never know where it's going to lead. So congratulations, you've now got 10,000 paying customers you're probably a real business at that point, even though still small, we were still small then, uh, maybe 50 employees or so, but you've got 10,000 paying customers. As I said, we were bootstrapped at the be beginning, so we had to find a revenue model early and not get too far out in front of our skis. Rocket Lawyer was not a company that ever had the luxury of, you know, we're gonna get a million users and see what happens. We didn't, we didn't roll like that. So one of the risks that we took, even before we had uh, venture backing, is a free trial and to start to explore a freemium model. Much of our journey upward actually has been opening up more and more of the service to users for free, never forgetting that at, at the core, our mission is to bring justice to more people at lower cost. And so we intend to continue to open up more and more of the service for free, and a lot of that has just been a working capital thing. The more working capital we get, the more we open up for free, and the more we get people like Michelle who lives here in San Francisco, uh, one of our customers. She owns a small business. She rents uh, apartments, great business in San Francisco. <laughs> she started out using Rocket Lawyer for personal matters, uh, estate planning. She had an issue with her mom, a health crisis with her mom, which is not unusual as all of us, are, our parents are 
aging, uh, and to also d handle childcare for her two young girls. But what we found out is as we started to explore a freemium model, we let users like Michelle start to do some things for free and explore. She actually started using Rocket Lawyer for her business as well. And so if you don't try it, you'll never know. 10,000 is actually a really good time to experiment. I'm going to talk about experimentation all the way through. There's, there's a tendency, again, especially for a business like ours, that we needed the revenue uh, to, to not try new things when you find something that's working. You really have to break it over and over again to learn. And so one of the things we learned is one price doesn't fit all. Michelle was a great example of that. As we let her try more things uh, for free, she became an even better customer for us. The Charlie, uh, the, it takes courage to open up the Aperture on free. So how did you think about that decision with the users and with the lawyers? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I'm, I'm kind of getting to that because uh, we kind of dipped our toe in the water of free. And what we found out is, my gosh, how fast people started coming into the service. Yeah. And so uh, it didn't take actually that much courage. It, it took the courage to, to try it. Mm -hmm. um, what took more courage, I'm going to get to a little later, is when the rest of the industry started suing the hell out of us. And I'm a lawyer, so I, I don't begrudge people using the legal system. Mm. But uh, the, the more audacious that we got with our free service, the more we started mm. disrupting, ruffling feathers. Um, but, but, you know, making the decision to open up more of the service for free led to some really explosive growth for us. It was only maybe a year where we went from the 10,000 subscribers to 25,000 subscribers. But as we found out, if it breaks and you have 25,000 paying subscribers, and by the way, now that it's a freemium service, we had well over a million, close to two million users all together when we had the 25,000 paying users, uh, that's a lot of people. And if it breaks, you're going to make a lot of people mad. And we, we did. <laughs> uh, 25,000 subscribers and more than a million users is when we massively committed to investing in our team and infrastructure. It's when we you know, hired people really fast, maybe 100 people in a year. That was the, when we raised uh, venture capital, when we really started to understand that we had an opportunity, but we could really screw it up, and uh, we could screw it up fast. And so we realized that our proof of concept code was breaking. We had too many uh, corners in it. Uh, we had to start over with the whole code base uh, and, and build a new platform. Now, we're still building on that same platform, and it's a few years later, but that platform has taken tens of millions of dollars to build, uh, and, and, and it's still a work in progress, but it has resulted in a business that can now scale uh, far beyond where it was then and, I, and uh, hopefully where it's going. So another thing that we had to really invest in at about that 25,000 uh, paying subscriber level is customer support. Uh, one of the things that we learned is Rocket Lawyer is actually better for business. And so uh, we started to hire people like Ashley Hess, who's in our Ogden, Utah office, uh, before customers like Lisa Murphy, who's the owner of Sosu Sauces. Uh, Lisa incorporated her business with us. She does uh, uh, any of her legal matters that come up. We handle them for her, but she needs, Lisa needs somebody to talk to. And so we had to start investing in people for our business users to talk to. This is when we figured out, as I said, that business people are our best customers. Self-employed individuals and small business operators now make up the majority of our revenue, even though individuals, families are still the vast majority of our users. It's those business customers that are 80% or more of our uh, sales today. So in becoming a company that worked with small businesses primarily, we had to add an inside sales team uh, focused on those SMBs. We had to learn all about uh, sales process and sales metrics. Um, we uh, now had SMBs as our key customers. We had to hire a VP of customer success and go through the process of opening our own call center, managing our own call center. We wanted to do that uh, the rocket lawyer way. Uh, today, we have about 50 people on the phones uh, all the time. In Ogden, Utah, we did a bake-off among three different uh, cities and decided on Ogden for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so all of those sorts of issues really came to the fore when we had about the 25,000 users. 
I can't say enough about the transformation of our business when we committed to having somebody for our business users to talk to. We pride ourselves on software that's easy to use. I think we were a pioneer in legal services, which is you know, dense with uh, lots of uh, words. The websites were dense, the apps were dense, everything was full of words. Uh, when we started Rocket Lawyer with an idea that those services were for people who wanted to read a bunch of legal jargon and we were for people who didn't want to read and that we were going to do okay. But part of that is we needed to have people to hold people's hands on the phone and chat, etc. People like uh, Braden, Russell, Tessie, Ashley, talking to customers, again, a landlord, a DJ, uh, Lisa you met, uh, a, a, a tech uh, entrepreneur, the last person listed there. It was also when we started to learn who our customers were and how to segment and how to deliver the customized type of interaction with them that their segment demanded. So we were growing up. Okay, so here's what we were talking about <laughs> a minute ago. Yes. So about 50,000 subscribers, uh, over 20 million in annual revenue, uh, you know, maybe 5 million users altogether. That was the time that the wolf started coming to the door. Mm -hmm. That was the time that incumbents, uh, regulators, people started knowing who Rocket Lawyer was, started to, some perceive Rocket Lawyer as an opportunity, many perceive Rocket Lawyer as a threat. And so, as I said, I'm the last person on earth to begrudge anyone getting lawyered up and availing themselves of our magnificent legal system. But if you're a disruptor, as you start to uh, get bigger, you have to be ready. You have to be ready uh, with your processes. You have to be compliant with the law. Uh, you have to understand that, as Martin Luther King said, you, if it's an unjust law or a law that stifles innovation, you break the law. But you have to be ready to, to, for that fight when you do break the law, when you uh, are pushing the envelope of regulation and, and uh, it, they're going to come at, at you privately. They're going to come at you uh, uh, as far as uh, government compliance is concerned. So as it says here, watch, their, watch your back. Um, our biggest competitor, LegalZoom, launched a very public lawsuit against us uh, three years ago as, as they started perceiving us as more of a threat. Uh, we had to be able to fight back. And uh, as Michael Arrington, in our case, uh, Michael Arrington posted on TechCrunch, uh, I don't know who's going to win this battle, but I'm going to buy my legal services from whoever does. Mm. So it's over. We're still standing. <laughs> well, I think this one uh, is interesting it's, as well from a venture capital perspective, because to some degree, if there is an ultimately conflict, it's not interesting. Sounds like it became very interesting, uh, but you need to have the right venture people around the table that appreciate that and can do that. And you certainly have done so with the firms that you've worked with. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And uh, I could maybe will write a book about that part. Uh, board dynamics, um, uh, corporate governance was kind of my career before I started Rocket Lawyer. Um, and so it is really important that, you, that your board has the right culture. Um, that you're very transparent with your board, that your board is part of these decisions. You, you, you need them uh, behind you. And um, we, uh, this, these things take a lot of time. So we did subsequent rounds of financing with this litigation pending. And actually that turned out to be a really good thing because the people who got on board were really on board really uh, at that point. But um, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, you have to um, pick your, uh, it's just about culture and it's about uh, transparency communication, um, ultimately. It's a great point. So moving on, uh, paywalls. So you have 50, the back to you know, the context here, you've got 50,000 paying customers. If you're a freemium service, you have millions of uh, free users. And uh, uh, you've got a lot of demands at this point. You're probably doing business uh, outside the United States. This is about the time that we launched Rocket Lawyer UK. Um, you are probably, if you've invested in infrastructure, you may be burning a lot of cash uh, at this point. And it's time that investors are starting to look at you as more of a later stage, uh, later stage enterprise. So you have to start to think about paywalls and, and revenue. But uh, it's really important to do it in a way 
that builds user trust. So we've realized now, after a lot of testing and a lot of hard work, that users really don't mind paying for things if the paywalls are contextual and after we've gained their confidence in the product. So here's an example of, of a mobile experience where somebody's creating uh, a document on Rocket Lawyer, and uh, we've given them a certain amount of documents for free. Now we want them to pay for the next one. Um, we spend a lot of time and energy uh, and money on an e-commerce service that is homegrown that enables us to do all that stuff consumers expect. One click, bang, you're done. All of those sorts of things, convenience, it makes a big difference for the user. So another thing about that 50,000 subscriber part and about taking risks, uh, the bigger that we've gotten, the more we can experiment because we can make a lot of mistakes and get away with it. So you have to do that. We've made some doozy mistakes. What's great is as we've grown, we found that we can fail more and not less often. And as I said, we can get away with it because we can, you know, we can lose 1,000 users, uh, but we can gain uh, 10,000. And as long as it works that way and you're willing to, to try it, you're going to be uh, great. But if you don't and you stay stagnant too long, as we've, as we've seen in our business, the, the competitors come fast and furious at you, doing the same old thing over and over again. Uh, so a part of experimenting is you have to love your experiments that don't work. You've got to love, love your losers. One of my big losers as the founder is I really, really believe that we can sell a lot of insurance on Rocket Lawyer. I still think so, but we haven't pulled it off yet. Um, we've had a couple of partnerships with big insurance carriers to sell life insurance. We've had more success with business insurance, but, um, and sort of the theme, we've had more success with business in general um, making money than consumers. But uh, life insurance, I still think it makes perfect sense. The average person who comes in to do an estate plan, they don't have a lot of assets. Life insurance and having life insurance is, is, is really something that is good counsel to their families. And so I still think that if we give them the right counsel, good counsel, that it's going to work out in the end. But we really haven't figured it out yet and have had a lot of losers in that um, part of the business. Um, however, we've had a lot of winners as well. And so what, here's an example of something that's worked out beautifully. And, and you've really got to double down on your winners. Um, this is pretty simple. We started, uh, we started Rocket Lawyer right before smartphones became ubiquitous. So admittedly, we're, we were in not initially a mobile-first company. We're a desktop. Um, that's changed, and many of our winning improvements over the last few years have been happening on phones. This is a really simple example of a registration change that doubled our mobile registration rate. As a result, it drove up our overall registration rate in a really, really meaningful way. And again, it was just back to context and making sure that it was contextualized why we needed personally identifiable information so that you can save your work, share your work with others. As we get better at contextualizing why we're asking for stuff, customers have trusted us more. Our registration rate on mobile uh, has doubled, and mobile is rapidly becoming the majority of our user base. So. You've doubled again, 100,000. So you've gone from 50 to 100,000 paying users. So hey, I'm up here to give advice. As I said, we started out uh, being bootstrapped. Losing money makes me really nervous. It doesn't, I mean, a lot of you probably run businesses that are bigger than ours, uh, that may have a lot more revenue, may be uh, more profitable or burning a lot more money. Um, but for us, and again, I think it's a cultural thing, uh, I just think that a service that has over 100,000 paying customers should not be losing a lot of money. Uh, maybe that's just me, uh, but I think uh, it's really worked out well for us that between 50,000 and 100,000, we have been screaming. We're not quite profitable yet, but we're really, really close. And we've been screaming toward uh, being profitable business that I think will be quite a nice cash flow positive business. Um, uh, uh, in, in the years to come, with, not without a lot of focus on the bottom line and hard work. Okay, last one. Uh, the uh, the 100,000 bonus tip <laughs> is uh, you're not that big yet. So uh, 100,000 paying subscribers, 
probably between 50, 100 million uh, dollars of revenue. Um, but you, you know, there's a whole big world out there, and we've got to get to a million. I hope to come uh, back to Saster when we have a million paying users. Um, thank you, and good luck. Well, first of all, Charlie, personally, uh, for my friends, my family, people all over the world, thank you for democratizing legal services. It's greatly appreciated. Are there any questions for Charlie from the audience? Hello? When looking at adoption, you could either have a paywall somewhere on a website or you can charge through the Google Play Store or iTunes. How do you make that decision? Because you could have better adoption, but you lose 30% of your revenue versus pointing them somewhere else to then log in through their mobile app. Yeah, um, I'm, we're all about what the user experience and um, for users, it's, it's more convenient. For them, uh, you have to be where they are. And so that's kind of my answer to a lot of things. Whatever is the most convenient for the user, you've got you've to do it that way or somebody else will. Uh, there's also, uh, not to get too deep into the numbers, but if you look at your customer acquisition cost, uh, the 30% on the Play Store, the, the uh, App Store, is, isn't really out of whack with acquisition costs uh, elsewhere. So um, for me, it's that real, for us, that really hasn't been an impediment, something we talk a lot about, but the decision ultimately comes down to make it super, super drop dead simple for the user. Actually. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I've used Rocket Lawyer for probably about five years now, and uh, Thank you. I've, I've watched you guys transition from what was the interface and experience before to now what it is now. Um, when you guys ripped up the old code, what, did you hit the metrics you were going for? Was it just you knew the old code was just not good enough to scale? How did you measure um, making sure that your new code um, you know, hit the metrics that you wanted to hit? once you launched it. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot to unpack there. But first, thank you for being a customer. You're welcome. <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so it, it's, it's an arduous process. Um, I, I won't um, lie to you. If I could do it all over again, I would have started with where, where we're at now. Um, but but we, we, we aren't able to do, weren't able to do that. So it's been very, very, very incremental for us. Um, we did not rip out the old code base all at once. In fact, we still run a sliver of the business on the old code base. Um, we, what we committed to was every new service that we introduced was on the new code base. Um, we committed to um, being API-driven, service-oriented, you know, um, pushing, we actually committed to pushing a lot of code uh, up front, so we were doing more Node.js and development like that. Um, so we, we made a commitment to an architecture, but we did not. In fact, the, the places where we could have had really disastrous results and almost did is we went through a stage in the business where there was this dogma and some dogmatic engineers associated with, oh, that's horrible, and the, this is the only way to do it. And today, I think the team is more balanced and, again, more user focused. So we, did, we didn't rip it all out, but we're, we're almost done replacing it. It'll probably take another year to maybe even 18 months before it's all gone. And uh, if you're a user and, and you like it, we just uh, refocused ourselves on thinking about, look, we've got a service that we need to deploy rather than any sort of uh, dogma and, uh, you know, I've got a Java jersey on and I've, I've got a Scala jersey on or whatever. Charlie, quick question over here. Could you talk a little bit about how your customer acquisition efforts changed going to 10,000 and then up to 100,000? Did things shift in terms of what type of paid acquisition you've done? And how did you compete with people like LegalZoom that had been there for years and were probably dominating a lot of things like Google AdWords? Yeah. Um, so. So we started out doing a lot of paid acquisition, uh, a lot of search marketing. 
We still do a lot of search marketing. Um, uh, we've, we've always been good at search marketing. So that was, uh, that was kind of a core competency that we started the business with. Um, over time, the majority of our traffic comes from sources other than search marketing, but our search marketing, our search advertising budget is actually bigger, you know, year after year. So we, you know, the brand, uh, you get more word of mouth. We introduce services like eSign, uh, eSign, very viral service. Um, we uh, originally uh, licensed uh, EchoSign, so I was one of Jason's first customers. Um, and uh, eventually we decided to build our own eSign service just because of the scale. We do about 40 million legal documents a year on, on Rocket Lawyer, and uh, that added virality. So um, it's just been a, a natural, um, you know, first and foremost, don't run out of money. If you don't, you just sort of naturally, we're getting bigger. Uh, there's more word of mouth. We've got, we've expanded our advertising channels. Um, we also, and I'm, I'm gonna put a shameless plug out there, you know, one of the uh, exciting ways we're acquiring users now is uh, some of the comp many, I bet there's many companies here that are customers of ours. Um, you can receive Rocket Lawyer as an employee benefit. And so uh, ask your employer <laughs> Uh, if you don't have a Rocket Lawyer uh, account, it'll get you uh, help from lawyers at a, at a real uh, affordable rate. So that's another way that we've been acquiring uh, users. Uh, quick question. No, um, we also work in a build a product for a legal space, but my question is, and uh, you mentioned um, dogmatic engineers, and how many of those do you have, and how have you how you deal with an engineers who are stuck up on the old ways? and don't want to change this. Say the last part again, how do we deal with engineers? With engineers who are stuck up on the old ways or like this is the way it has to be and there is no other way. Um, how do you deal with the engineering team who is... Um... Yeah. Um, you know, the, the last, uh, I, I got to eavesdrop on the last uh, conversation and there, there, were ta there was a conversation about, you know, when do you just have to let somebody go? Um, uh, ultimately, you, you have to have a consistent culture and uh, either folks are in or they're not in that uh, culture. And engineering is a place where you, you really need a consistent culture, uh, in, in my opinion. So we've just, uh, over, the, over the years, um, we, we have an engineering office in Mexico that's actually been phenomenal. It's got about 30 developers in that office. Uh, and uh, we've actually hired a bunch of engineers in our London office. Uh, and of course, you know, our biggest office is still San Francisco. So really for us, it's Mexico, London, San Francisco. They, they have a, you know, even though they're different nationalities, there's a really consistent uh, culture. And we worked hard to develop what we call the Rocket Lawyer Way. Uh, and it was really homegrown, but it's documented. Um, we train uh, new engineers as we hire them. We, te we do a lot of testing now as we're hiring engineers, and the testing isn't only uh, technical competence, but it you know, has to do with, is this going to be the right psychological, social, cultural fit um, for just how we, how we have to do things? Thank you. Well, please thank me. Uh, join me in thanking Charlie uh, for sharing his wisdom from Rocket Lawyer. Thank you. <laughs>